All right, I think we'll go ahead and get started. Uh, hello and welcome everybody to the third and final installment of the Discovering Our Ancestors and Preserving Historic Gravesites webinar series, uh, Beginning to Care for a Gravesite. My name is Mary Fernandez and I am a program coordinator for the Preservation Services and Outreach Department of the National Trust for Historic Preservation. Sourcing funding and building public investment are often critical towards preserving historic cemeteries. And this third webinar in the series will review strategies for carrying out basic preservation work and recruiting and working with volunteers. Uh, and we'll also explore public interpretation and engagement as fundraising opportunities. The National Trust has prioritized the preservation of historic cemeteries through several initiatives and programs, including through grant making, the Hope Crew, which you'll hear more about today, and other forms of advocacy like our work at the Shaco Bottom and through America's 11 most endangered historic places, uh, including the ancestral places of Southwest Utah in 2019, the indigenous burial site at Rasawek in, <clears throat> pardon me, in Virginia, and the West Berkeley Shell Mound and Village Site in California in 2020, the Morning Star Tabernacle Number 88 Order of Moses Cemetery and Hall in Maryland in 2021, and Olivewood Cemetery in 2022. As many of you know, the needs related to historic uh, preserving historic cemeteries is just absolutely enormous. Uh, and the National Trust is committed to continuing to provide resources and tools to address that need, such as this webinar series, uh, as well as an in-person event this fall, uh, coordinating with our annual Pass Forward Conference in Washington, D.C. And you'll hear a, a little bit more about that at the end of this webinar. Yeah, I like to say personally that everyone has a cemetery. Uh, I myself came to be passionate about cemeteries due to my professional background in museums and historic sites. Uh, most recently, before joining the National Trust, I served as the Director of Special Events, Special Projects and Volunteers at Historic Oakland Cemetery in Atlanta, Georgia. Uh, I am thrilled to introduce my co-host today, Jason Church with the National Center for Preservation Technology and Training. Jason, if you'd like to hop on and say a few words. Hello, everybody. Thank you, Mary. Uh, so looking forward to chatting with you more today. Uh, this is the third of our series, so uh, hopefully we can add more uh, to the information. So I'm um, with the National Center for Preservation Technology and Training. We're a National Park Service research office uh, located in Natchitoches, Louisiana. And one of our initiatives is historic cemetery work. So we do research on cemeteries, we do training on cemeteries, um, we do scientific investigations of cleaners and coatings and things like that. So just really excited to uh, talk more about cemeteries with people. We're excited to have you here, Jason. Uh, in case you don't know, the Preservation Leadership Forum is the professional membership program of the National Trust for Historic Preservation. And this webinar series is made possible by members of Preservation Leadership Forum. And we sincerely thank those of you who are here with us today. Uh, before we begin, here are a few technical logistics. Uh, we will take questions from the audience during the uh, end of the webinar. Uh, so please send questions via the Q&A function directly to panelists. Uh, you're welcome to submit at any point during the webinar, but we will be waiting until the Q&A section to answer questions. Uh, you're also encouraged to communicate to all participants through the chat function. The closed captioning function is enabled for this webinar, uh, and following the program, we will send out a recording of today's webinar directly to the email you used to register. Um, finally, all forum webinars are available on our National Trust YouTube channel. Uh, I encourage you to please share the recording with your colleagues working to preserve historic cemeteries, and as many of y'all have already done, please feel free to introduce yourself and your cemetery in the chat and let us know what future topics or tools you'd like to see. All right, next slide. I'm happy to introduce first up Molly Baker as one of our panelists. Molly Baker serves as Hope Crew Manager in the Preservation Services and Outreach Department at the National Trust for Historic Preservation. Her focus is growing interest in the building preservation, in building, pre <clears throat> pardon me, in the building preservation trades by engaging a younger, more diverse audience in hands-on preservation opportunities, including cemetery preservation. Additionally, she has partnered with Milan Jordan, Hope Crew Director, to expand the program, finding the place where architecture fields and preservation trades intersect, working with architecture students on campus stewardship, community engagement, and documentation techniques. Take it away, Molly. Thanks, Mary. 
Thank you so much for having me here today. Um, I'm really happy to tell you a little bit about our work with the Hope Crew program and specifically talk about the projects that we've engaged in as a, a, a means to talk about interventions that you can use at cemeteries you love. Um, the, if you can go ahead and advance the slide. Um, and one more. Um, I'll begin with just talking about Hope Crew in general. It's an acronym for Hands-On Preservation Experience, and it was founded in 2014 with the, in, uh, with the goal of engaging a broader audience and building preservation traits, and specifically a younger and more diverse audience. Um, next slide. Uh, since our founding, we've assisted in over $19 million worth of preservation work, engaged with 3,700 volunteers, worked with 800 paid participants or trainees, and worked at 190 historic sites. And of those 190 historic sites, we've worked at quite a few cemeteries. And as I mentioned, I'm gonna highlight some of those projects and talk about those interventions uh, and detail the work that we did there as a model um, that you possibly could use at the cemeteries that you're working in to preserve. Next slide. So the first project I'd love to highlight is our um, project at Kalapapa National Park. Um, it is located on the island of Molokai. Um, it was um, a haven for people with leprosy or Hansen's disease from 1866 to 1969. Um, in that time, over 8,000 people were sent there um, to live. Uh, at, at, in the beginning stages of, of the residency there, it was a really rough place to live, um, but the people pulled together and created a community and uh, made a safe place for people to go um, and live their lives with Hansen's disease. Um, we worked with um, the local college at the University of Hilo, uh, of Hawaii at Hilo. Their Hawaiian Studies program was very interested in a cultural immersion experience and a preservation trades training opportunity. So this was a perfect location. Um, we worked um, with Jason at Na the National Center for Preservation Technology and Training, and also Rusty Brenner of um, Texas Preservation, uh, Cemetery Preservation Restoration. Um, to train these students on how to clean the, the headstones. In the time we were there, we were able to clean all 1,200 graves and even locate some missing headstones. Um, the project, in addition to the preservation work, had an emphasis on learning about the ancestors that they were caring for by cleaning these headstones and the cultural significance of that place. And as part of that, there were ceremonies that took place daily, including asking the ancestors if we could enter the site. Um, this uh, piece of Hawaiian culture is something that we've incorporated into our projects, not necessarily the ceremony, but pausing before we enter a historic cemetery and taking note of the, the, the people are, that are buried there and noting their lives. Um, and that pause gives us space to um, enter the site in a respectful manner and remind our participants of the reasons why we're there. Um, if, you don't mind dropping in the chat, there's a link to the article and also some information on how to properly clean headstones. Um, we typically work with a product called D2. It um, removes biological growth. It's really easy to work with. It's um, safe to work with and it makes a big impact on removing those damaging biological growths that are found on headstones. Um, so that's one way in which you can um, assist your uh, historic cemetery. Um, next slide. Oh, and, and this is our crew, uh, a picture of our crew that we worked with there. It was a really great project we were thrilled to be a part of. Uh, next slide. The next uh, project that I'm gonna highlight is the Old City Cemetery in Tallahassee, Florida. Um, this is a historically segregated cemetery. Um, it was a city burial ground. And by means of our digital documentation fellowship uh, in support of with the Action Fund, we were able to um, develop this program to work with arch architecture students at HBCUs and help them explore the intersection of preservation and architecture studies. Um, and this is through either campus projects or campus community um, projects. And so Old City Cemetery is adjacent to the Florida A&M campus. And we were able to work at that site doing um, documentation, headstone cleaning and GIS mapping. Um, by means of the work that our fellow Joshua did, we were able to create a walking tour of the notable figures specifically buried in the African American side of the cemetery. Um, but additionally, we were able to clean the headstones and create a project that engaged his classmates 
and learning about um, this burial ground. And if you can drop a link to the documentary in there um, for me, um, that will show you a little bit more about this fellowship and specifically the work that Joshua was able to do here at the Old City Cemetery, um, working right alongside the city officials, um, including um, Matt Lutz, who um, prioritized righting the wrongs um, that had been made here at this cemetery and making sure that, this, that everyone's story was told by means of this project. Next slide. Uh, and there's Matt Lutz there demonstrating some of the damage of the headstones. Um, we were able to do some cleaning work and future work will engage um, local community members in repair methods. Uh, next slide. The next project I'd love to highlight was a three year partnership project at the Chalmette Cemetery and Battlefield. It's a national park site. Again, we worked alongside um, the National Center for Preservation Technology and Training and Jason. Um, to create uh, volunteer opportunities to go and do resetting efforts here at the Chalmette Cemetery and Battlefield. Um, the cemetery site is um, the final resting place of many um, that died during the Civil War, Union soldiers that died during the Civil War, including um, the, um, the, I think there's 14,000 headstones and there's a number of uh, the colored troops buried there as well. Um, it was a really great opportunity for us to teach um, cleaning documentation, but resetting primarily. Um, as with many of these um, burial grounds at battlefield sites, um, the um, cemeteries are all laid out in a grid. And when they begin to slide and slip, it's very noticeable. So that resetting was a really great opportunity to teach that skill. That's one that um, can be intimidating on the surface. Um, we're gonna drop a link to a tutorial on how to reset, um, but with the right tools, this project showed that anybody can learn that technique and it can make a big impact. Um, if you'll go to the next slide. Um, the next project I'm going to focus on is um, a Black Land Loss Seminar. Or it was a partnership in connection with the University of the District of Columbia and the Latin American Youth Center, um, their conservation course specifically. Um, we worked at two sites, um, one the Lafayette Pointer Park and the other the Mount Zion Female Union Band Cemetery. Um, the park had been put over top of a burial ground and none of the headstones remained. So we partnered with the Blackland Moss seminar course to explore how to identify those graves. Um, if you advance to the next slide, we used a technology um, of GPR site scanning, um, working with um, Ohio Valley um, Archaeology to do a scan to make sure that those places of burial were noted um, and presented so that there could be um, future uh, signage to show that this was once a burial ground. Um, additionally, if you go to the next slide, we were able to work at Mount Zion Female Band Cemetery. Um, this cemetery had been um, neglected for many years. There's quite a bit of overgrowth. The, the current owners have um, been working tirelessly to, to clear that land. We were able to work with our conser conservation corps participants to do additional clearing to identify missing graves. Um, through that ground penetrating radar, we were able to um, map out an area in which we, we found hundreds of missing grave markers um, and grave sites. Uh, if you advance to the next slide, we also incorporated a photogrammetry technique so that the headstones that were illegible could be read. Um, that was a really cool technique that we used for that. Um, and if um, you drop the article in the chat, it talks more about how you can utilize these technologies at your own cemetery. Next slide. The last site I'd love to highlight is one that was mentioned, the Olivewood Cemetery. Um, Olivewood is a great example of um, the ways in which the programs that the trust come together to support a historic site. Olivewood was placed on the 11 most list. It also has been a recipient of the African American Cultural Heritage Action Fund grant. It is um, the first African-American cemetery incorporated um, in the city of Houston. Um, it has many issues, um, one of which is um, the results of climate change, but also some have to do with development all around the site, um, including highways that um, made for some slippage of cemetery headstones and the loss of some grave sites. Um, this particular project though, we partnered with a program um, that was exploring um, digital media 
So our participant, Gabby, was also a part of our digital documentation fellowship, but she came to us as a design media student and wanted to assist the site in some way. So we worked with Gabby and her fellow students to create a brand book um, to highlight the, the, the site. So this is something important that could create um, branding so that the site can use that to grow their social media following to use on their website. These are great tools to spread the word about your historic site. Um, using these modern means to tell the story of your cemetery is a way to engage uh, volunteers for fundraising efforts. So this was a great tool that Gabby was able to present to Olive, Olive Wood Cemetery. Um, if you go to the next slide, um, that's going to conclude um, my portion of the, the presentation, um, but there are some additional resources that we're going to pop into the chat. And if you'd like to um, reach out to talk a little bit more about any of these different interventions, I'd love to share more about it. Thank you. Thanks, Molly. I go, go to the next slide, please. All right. Uh, so introducing Jason Church, who you just heard from um, shortly before Molly's presentation. Jason Church is the Chief of Technical Services at the National Center for Preservation Technology and Training with the National Park Service. Jason, Jason divides his time between conducting in-house research, organizing various training events, and teaching hands-on conservation workshops. Church is currently the Conservation Chair of the Association for Gravestone Studies. Thanks, Jason. Thank you, Mary. Yes, I'm actually joining you today from my hotel in uh, Denver. I'm here with the Association for Gravestones Conf uh, Studies Annual Conference is this week. Uh, so we're out here in Denver uh, visiting cemeteries and getting ready to do some hands-on uh, cemetery workshop at Evergreen Cemetery in Colorado Springs. So a very cemetery-filled day. So next slide. So I kind of want to talk about sort of an intro to cemetery care. And I know in the prior workshop, uh, prior webinars, we've talked about documentation and how that's a great thing you can do with volunteers. I want to move it a little bit more toward uh, sort of caring physically for the cemetery and what we can do with volunteers. I know Mary's going to talk more about, um, you know, getting interest and getting volunteers. And, you know, Molly just gave great examples of some just amazing projects that they've done with you know huge groups of volunteers, uh, I know the the Hope Crews had. I think we ran seven hundred people through Chalmette, um one year. So for in one month, so you know it's it's a lot easier than you think to get volunteers. Next slide. So the first thing you've got to decide before you start bringing volunteers in, before you start caring for the cemetery, is you know, what do you want? What's your end goal for your cemetery? And I don't think we think about this a lot of times. Everyone just, you know, says, oh, we want to clean it. We want it to, we, we need to decide as a cemetery, what's sustainable for you? What's your budget like? What's your workforce like? Are you in an area where we can get a lot of volunteers? Are you in an area that's an, maybe an aging community that you can not, you know, you get a few volunteers? So what are you comfortable with? What's the look and the overall appearance and sort of the sustainability of your site? Um, and there's lots of things to think about with that. So for example, this is Jefferson Barracks National Cemetery. And I know a lot of the cemeteries I work with, this is what they want. But we have to be realistic that the look of a cemetery like this probably isn't achievable uh, for 90% you know, of the cemeteries out there. So you really have to decide, you know, what, what do you want out of your cemetery? Next slide. And what's right for you? So, for example, we were just working in Rockport, Texas, an absolute amazing cemetery that has decided that, you know, they were spending all of their budget a year mowing and trying to maintain the grass. And was that really what they wanted? So they decided to sort of shift gears. And now they have seeded the entire cemetery with native wildflowers. And it's a really, really amazing site. Um, when I was there, we were there doing some hurricane recovery work uh, with Texas Historic Commission, resetting graves. But I was amazed at the amount of birders that were there. So literally people drive in all day long 
Uh, this has become quite the bird watching area. There are birds everywhere. Uh, I've never seen so many butterflies in all my life. So that's what they decided was right for them, that trying the sustainability of keeping that mode like a golf course just was not realistic. So in the other photograph we see, this is Reddy's River uh, Church in Wilbar, North Carolina. This is my family cemetery. Was just there last week. And they do a beautiful job of mowing it, but they've decided, you know, the head, cleaning the headstones just isn't what our priority is. We don't have the budget for it. We're going to keep the, uh, they have a very nice selection of local grasses, uh, native grasses that doesn't need a lot of maintenance. Um, but they decided the look of the cemetery, they were just going to keep with a weathered look. They, they welcome family members to clean their own. But as a whole, they've decided to leave the cemetery as it is. And it's a beautiful cemetery. Um, there's definitely nothing wrong with it. I think they're doing a great job maintaining it. Next slide, please. So one of the things I want to talk about was really sort of uh, what we call, you know, getting into the weeds. I talked to a lot of cemeteries that are starting with a cemetery that looks like this. This is one that um, my Girl Scout troop and I have taken over. Uh, this is an African-American cemetery in Reedheimer, Louisiana. It was considered abandoned and lost. Um, and they, the local nature preserve has just gained, regained access to it. And so we have started uh, basically from scratch. No one's really been in there probably since the 1970s. And, you know, how do you start with that? I know it's a really daunting task, but I think it's a lot more achievable than people think. Uh, next slide, please. So if you think back to what you just saw, the the how overgrown it was, you can see a few headstones and then the uh, actually, previous slide, please. So this is what we're starting with, the smaller photograph. Um, this is completely overgrown. We were told there were only four or five grave markers in the site. And then on the larger photograph, this, is, this isn't the end of the day. This is at about lunchtime on the first day of work. So you could see how much we were able to clear. And next slide. You will see my work crew. This is my entire work crew, plus myself and um, Rick, who runs the wildlife preserve. Um, and all we had, Rick had a small uh, mower, a little, actually it's a little walk behind bush hog. And we had a small, you know, 18 inch chainsaw. Um, and then the rest has all been done by hand uh, by these five young ladies uh, that are Girl Scouts. So this, um, this site took us about six hours to clear. So I talk to people who, who really see their project as something that's too daunting to even accomplish. They say, well, there's two of us, we can't get volunteers, but you know, this is a whole site. This is about a half acre that we cleared in six hours with um, six people, you know, five, five young ladies um, who, and, and myself and Rick. So it, it's totally achievable. We actually found about 20 some headstones. Um, that's uh, you know about 20 more than, uh, than they thought were in there. Uh, and a, a, a large selection of funeral home markers from the 40s that are still intact. Um, so now the, the task is to clean and, and um, identify some of the art, unmarked graves that are in there and, and uh, you know, be able to research the people who are buried there to be able to honor them. Next slide. So, I mean, you know, maintaining the landscape is one of the first things that you can definitely do, you know, going in cleaning. We do a lot of cleanup days where we just bring in people, um, you know, to rake or to pick up trash, that sort of thing. But the other big thing is, of course, everybody wants to clean. And it's easy to get, um, you know, large groups of volunteers. This is another HOPE project like Molly talked about. Uh, I think we had 300 people show up in Stones River, Tennessee for a one day cleaning. Uh, we were able to clean almost the entire cemetery. Um, so about 5,000 graves in three hours. We were supposed to go four hours. We would have gotten it all done, but lunch came early. And uh, when lunch, when as lunch drove in, everyone sort of followed the lunch truck. But it's amazing how many volunteers are coming out just to, to do this. Uh, next slide, please. 
And the reason everyone wants to clean is because it's fun. It's instant gratification. I mean, we see all these photographs online. Everyone looks so happy. The reason is because they are. Um, this is a really fun thing to do. It's very enjoyable. It's definitely something people can walk away with and feel satisfied that they really did something. And to me, cemetery cleaning is not as much to, for me about trying to maintain this clean look of a cemetery. To me, it's a really a way to get community members involved and interested in your cemetery. So for example, the two young ladies with grambling shirts on, I, I had working with Grambling University quite often. They have a great sociology program that does a lot for cemeteries, a lot of research in them. And you know, these two ladies, they got in there, started cleaning, and were like, when can we do this again? I'm going home to buy myself a set of brushes. I'm going to start doing this all the time. It's really a way to get people interested. You get those people coming back to your cemetery, volunteering for more things, more meaningful things. Those are the people that uh, Mary's going to talk about later that you can really get into getting them on your boards, getting them interested in planting trees and, and doing bigger, more meaningful projects. So to me, I'm not a fan of always trying to clean cemeteries. Like I said earlier, you really have to pick um, a site and, and decide how clean do you want to keep this. Um, over cleaning is definitely a big thing and people I think clean too much a lot of times, but the reality is it is a good way to get people into the cemetery and get them interested and get them active um, and, and make them have a connection to the site. Next slide, please. So the biggest reason that we're doing it, readability. You know, people, genealogists, researchers, they want to clean, they want to be able to read. This is the same headstone, um, just really obscure by the lichen. Uh, so after, you know, before clean, after clean, this is, you know, an hour. Next slide. Next slide, please. Jason, I'm sorry, you're breaking up a little bit. You might want to turn off your camera and see if that helps with the voice. Sure thing. So one of the things that most of the time we're cleaning, it's biological growth. I don't care where in the country you live, you probably have this. Uh, I'm, I live in the deep south. This is prevalent everywhere. And for that, next slide, the, what we're using is D2, uh, and Molly mentioned that earlier. It's a biocide, it's made to kill biological growth. So it's a detergent. So it cleans the headstone. It'll get soiling and things like that off, but it also has a biocidal agent that will kill that biological growth and keep it from coming back for a while. Now this doesn't last forever. Uh, I saw a question earlier uh, about that. It will come back. Biological growth will continue to come back. You can't stop it. Uh, there's nothing you can put on that headstone that will keep it from coming back forever. Um, don't believe anyone who tells you that. Um, we can't coat it with anything uh, that's going to keep it from coming back. It will come back. How fast it comes back really depends on the weather and the shade and humidity and things like that. But realistically, anywhere from six months to five years before we would have to consider coming back and recleaning this grave. Next slide. Now, biological cleaning is something that we can do with volunteers. I've done it with thousands of volunteers, thousands of youth groups, Boy Scout groups, Girl Scout groups, um, all kinds of stuff. But one of the things um, that you can't do and you should call a professional is if your cemetery has staining. Um, this could be hard water staining, it could be metallic staining, it could be vandalism uh, like the one for Massachusetts there that was covered in fry oil. Someone anointed uh, these graves. When you have that, this isn't something for volunteers. This is something to call a professional conservator in. Next slide, please. The other thing is vandalism and graffiti. Again, uh, this is not something you want to try to tackle yourself. This isn't something that you want to call a volunteers for. Uh, that happens a lot. Um, I. I work with a lot of sites and say, well, we just figured somebody could get it off. 
this is really where you want to take good photographs and call a professional in. Next slide, please. So we're going to talk a little bit about what not to do, and then we'll talk a little bit about what to do. Um, so I, I see this a lot, a lot of um, articles on the internet and on genealogy forums recommend, you know, using wire brushes or Nylox brushes or power equipment to clean. We don't recommend that ever. Um, wire brushes are going to leave metal behind. They're going to really erode the stone. Uh, Nylox brushes are nylon brushes that are impregnated with diamond. This is made to strip paint from metal. Next slide, please. And what you really have here is, um, you can see, hopefully you can see the detail of that. This is where someone has cleaned the top of this obelisk. And it does, it looks clean, it looks white. Within minutes, they actually cleaned the one uh, in the background as well. But on, on inspection, what you've really done is just eroded the top surface of the stone away. This sets up for um, more biological growth later because you've now it greatly increased the surface area of your stone. And so now you're going to com be combating that for life. You've now got a, a, a much larger surface area that's going to catch more biological growth. That's going to cause stain faster, get dirty quicker. That'll cause more cleaning. And besides that, you've done probably 100 years worth of natural erosion in a few minutes. Next slide, please. Um, don't recommend pressure power washers um, anything over about 500 PSI is too strong. Uh, most commercial power washers uh, that you buy at the box stores are 2,800, 3,500 PSI. Um, and that's really just going to cut away at the stone. And here's a couple of good examples where, you know, a good Samaritan uh, tried to clean these for someone. Uh, they volunteered to clean. And this is, this is how it, it turned out. Um, next slide, please. And acids and bleaches. Uh, so this is still used a lot. A lot of people still use bleach. Uh, and what it really does is erode the stone very quickly. So the larger photograph, the upright one, uh, that's where bleach has been used, really eaten away at the stone, taking all the detail out and making a very friable stone. And a, again, a lot more surface area. And the sort of core piece on the corner of this uh, monument, uh, that's a good indication where someone's used muriatic acid to clean. And that's, you get sort of this tan look to it. That's the metal ions that are in muriatic acid coming out to the surface. But you also have this very sort of translucent, sort of melted look, kind of like melted ice, like an ice sculpture, uh, where you're losing all the detail. Um, so definitely we don't recommend any of these. Next slide, please. And sort of the, we don't want to do any harm. We want to exercise patience. You know, remember the stone didn't get dirty in 30 minutes. It's probably not going to get clean in 30 minutes. So that's one of the things that we use a lot. Um, we use D2. It's a biocide that's going to kill the biological growth. One of the things I always warn, when you get done cleaning, it's going to look pretty good. Next slide, please. Um, but it's not going to look great. It's going to take a little time for that to lighten up. I'll talk about that again in a second. The other thing to look at, very important, is the equipment that you use. So we're looking at natural bristle brushes, um, really soft nylon brushes. So um, my friend Rusty Brenner, can, cemetery conservator, I work a lot with. Uh, he always says, if, if you're willing to scrub your body with it, that's an okay brush to use in the cemetery. Um, I think I'm a little bit more sensitive than that, but what I always say is if you're willing to clean the hood of your car with it, you're okay using it in the cemetery. So if you would not scrub the hood of your car, I wouldn't put it on a historic headstone. So soft bristle nylon, natural bristle brushes, um, all of these things work really well um, with water and then uh, you know D2 cleaner uh, out there to clean off that biological uh, or soiling. Next slide, please. And like I said, we talked about what not to use and follow the manufacturer's recommendations. Next slide, please. So the basic is, you know, we get the stone wet first, we apply our cleaner, uh, we start from the bottom and we work up. On small monuments, that's not really gonna matter. 
on bigger ones, you really will see a difference. It's going to get clean easier. Um, and lots of water to rinse. Now, a lot of times we don't have water on our sites. Just means you got to bring it with you. So five gallon buckets of water. I carry 30 gallon trash cans full of water. Uh, lots of different ways. And we've got videos and how to's on these that give you suggestions for how to get water to the cemetery and things like that. Um, so definitely something I, I've done this with thousands and thousands of volunteers. So this is something, like I said earlier, that really gets people interested. But anytime you're using a biocide like D2, the, the thing I always warn uh, when you get done, it's going to look good, but you're going to want it to look, I, I thought it was going to be cleaner than this, brighter than this. Give it some time. It takes a few weeks, maybe sometimes a few months for the cleaner to continue to work. Now, what's happening is you have scrubbed away the top layer of that biological growth and it's left a root system inside. And as uh, the sun comes out, the rain comes out, that root system is going to slowly work its way out of the pores of that stone. It's going to continue to lighten. So if you look, watch any of the TikTok videos, um, they usually have that last shot where it's really clean. That was usually taken about a month later and put back into the video. So something to keep in mind. Next slide, please. So if you want to interested in getting more information, um, easily Google uh, Google the NPS Preservation Brief number 48. It's available as a free PDF. And also on our website, we have tons of videos, how-to videos on cleaning and resetting, how-to videos on uh, removing landscape, or caring for landscape, um, how to trim trees, trim uh, weed eat, all that sort of thing in historic cemeteries. So lots of information. Um, hopefully you'll find what you need there. And if not, uh, drop me an email. Uh, next slide. And just wanted to point out, you know, we, we've sort of quickly glazed over this. This is something we usually teach, you know, in a day long class. Um, but we are doing, if anybody's interested, uh, I highly recommend attending the Pass Forward Conference. That's the National Trust is, Trust's annual conference. Um, and this year it's going to be in DC. And we're actually doing um, a session on documenting historic grave sites where we'll talk about some more of the things like photogrammetry and, and laser scanning and GPR, ground penetrating radar and mapping, and some of the things that Molly talked about. But we'll also have a hands-on cemetery cleaning workshop on the 11th uh, at a cemetery there in DC. So we'd love to see you. Please come out. Uh, like I said, and we'll we'll be doing a lot of these things hands-on where you actually uh, get to, to get your hands dirty and learn that yourself. So Hopefully, we will see some of you in D.C. in the fall. And I'm going to turn it back over to Mary. Thanks, Jason. Uh, there has never been a more true uh, slide than everyone wants to clean. It's true. Everyone wants to clean. It's a lot of fun. <laughs> Um, so I'm going to be talking today about cemetery interpretation. My background is in historic sites and museums. I've been in public education and public history programming for about 10 years now. Uh, and most recently, I served as the director of special events, special projects, and volunteers at the Historic Oakland Cemetery in Atlanta, Georgia. If you'll go to the next slide, please. And, you know, cemetery preservation, or pardon me, cemetery interpretation provides an incredible opportunity to share the story of your site and also to, you know, bring in public investment, uh, which hopefully comes uh, later in the form of literal investment, whether that's volunteerism or whether that's fundraising. Uh, this photo that you see on the slide is from uh, the Juneteenth celebration at Oakland Cemetery. Uh, that tour is being led by the incredible Dr. D.L. Henderson, who's written some amazing books. Definitely recommend checking out her work. Next slide, please. So why interpret cemeteries? Uh, as I said, by interpreting cemeteries, by sharing the story, sharing the history, looking at the history and finding ways to package it so that people can hear the, the story and understand it, uh, you really work to cultivate that public interest in your site. You know, you care very dear, very deeply about the cemetery uh, that you're working with, but, you know, you always have to work on you know, public buy-in. Why should they care about the cemetery? 
Uh, you can use this to help raise awareness of the preservation needs that you have on site, which every cemetery has preservation needs. Uh, you can highlight historic material and value. Uh, so, you know, cemeteries really, in, in many ways, can be a very encyclopedic look at the history of a place. It captures a snapshot of who was living there at the specific place and time. Uh, and that's an incredibly important resource that we often see in battlefields. We understand this about historic houses, but you know, despite the ubiquity of cemeteries, they're everywhere. They often become something that's kind of invisible in the background to the public, and they don't realize the rich history that can be found at these sites. Uh, you can also use interpretation to encourage site visitation and usage. Um, I'll go into that a little bit further later in my slideshow, but, you know, you don't want your cemetery to become for lack of a better phrase, dead space within your community. You want it to be somewhere, somewhere that's actively visited uh, to help you know, ensure the future preservation and, and future concern about its preservation within your community. And then finally, all of these things hopefully lead to fundraising efforts. Um, you can hold public events and programs that can directly raise funds or bring in someone new to the site that shows them its value and perhaps encourages them, to, encourages them to make a direct donation as well. Uh, next slide, please. So types of programming that can uh, be held within a cemetery. And really this is not an exhaustive list, just something that is frequently done at other sites uh, in the United States. Uh, history tours are one of the most accessible uh, means of programming at a historic site. Usually involves only one person that can lead the tour. Uh, it's a really great way to make direct one-on-one -on -one connections. And there's really very few barriers to entry besides doing the research and having the stories to share with the public. Um, naturalism can be a phenomenal tool for bringing people on site and kind of honors this dual usage of the site as urban green spaces or as green spaces in general. Um, bird watchers typically really love cemeteries. Uh, nature walks can be very um, fruitful there, you know, whether that's the native and um, non-native plants that are planted within cemetery sites, uh, as well as some of the materials of the cemetery itself. Uh, what stone is being used? What is the history of that stone within your community? Um, are there lichens or other uh, biological growth that is growing on the stone? What's the impact of that? Uh, also, citizen science can be uh, utilized on sites to really get build a great deal of engagement on that end. Like the iNaturalist app is a great way to um, encourage engagement with, with people on site. Um, volunteer work days, you know, as Jason said, not only is it, not only is that beneficial to the cemetery itself, uh, they're one of volunteers and can be one of the greatest ways of building uh, relationships uh, with your between your site and and potential stakeholders. Uh, theatrical performances uh, can be used on site to you know highlight certain history or draw connections. Holiday celebrations, such as Oakland's Juneteenth celebration. Um, as well as pumpkin patches. As someone who has worked in cemeteries, everyone, every member of the public wants to be in the cemetery around October. So it's always great when you can kind of channel that towards something productive. Um, also holiday decorations, you know, wreath sales to families so that they can decorate the specific sites. I've even taken part in a uh, tour of eternal homes where mausolea were decorated for the holidays. And that's, you know, a beautiful way of, um, you know, honoring the deceased and also, um, you know, bringing folks on, on into your cemetery as well. Uh, grief support and education uh, are one, uh, is one strategy that a lot of people have used. It's the perfect location really um, in many cases to have those kind of hard discussions. Um, looking at, uh, you know, all these different things that can be hosted on site, uh, but also the passive engagement and activities that build familiarity with your cemetery. And I'll get into that a little bit further. I'm also going to touch upon social media, since that's a very accessible way of sharing the story of your cemetery as well. Next slide. Uh, I will say, if you'll go back a slide, actually, real quick, uh, what I do discourage as far as programming uh, is anything to do with ghosts or scary stories. Uh, we had a phrase at Oakland that 
our programming was to enlighten, not frighten. Uh, and part of the rationale behind that is that, you know, you tell a ghost story, but that's not a ghost, that's someone's Aunt Ethel. <laughs> Uh, and so I, I would discourage from that particular type of programming, but otherwise I, I think there's a a real enthusiasm among the public to, you know, be involved and be there and present within the cemetery. Next slide, please. So looking at tours, um, you know, many, many cemeteries do historic tours. Uh, I really advocate for the cemetery uh, organization itself to hold these tours rather than to outsource to outside uh, tour companies. Typically you earn more income if you hold the tours yourself uh, and they can often be, you know, really shared duties as far as, you know, different stakeholders that are already involved with your cemetery. Uh, more involved examples of tours might include capturing the spirit of Oakland uh, at Oakland Cemetery in Atlanta. Uh, this particular tour is has become really large. It sells out every year in July, but uh, actors uh, do monologues and portray different residents of the cemetery uh, in October as a way to share the story of the you know residents that are buried there. Uh, and you know, while capturing the spirit of Oakland is a very large scale event, it can be scaled down. Uh, living history on site, living history. <laughs> can be a really impactful tool for reaching out to people uh, because it becomes very personal. Next slide, please. Uh, connecting the dots. So, you know, a lot of the first instinct when it comes to programming at cemeteries is, you know, pretty straightforward, telling the story of the individuals buried there. Uh, but, you know, programming also allows us to tell an even larger story when you look at you know, connecting cultural practices and the universality of death. Oftentimes the demographics of a community have changed from when the original inhabitants who buried their dead in a cemetery lived there. Uh, and so, you know, the stories of that cemetery don't necessarily always uh, reflect the community that exists there today. So how do you draw those connections? Well, we all have a relationship with death in one way or another. Uh, and so, for instance, at Lakewood Cemetery in Minneapolis, they have the Midsummer Memory Mandala, uh, Mandalas. And I'll let you read the description there, but it's a great way of looking at themes of, uh, you know, impermanence uh, and, you know, how life and death, you know, kind of is a shared experience across cultures. Uh, that is able to make connections that, you know, may not have existed when someone just goes into a space where they don't see them re themselves reflected in the history. Next slide, please. Uh, I was, you know, as a first generation American and a Latina, I really love playing a part in bringing this event to Oakland uh, for the Dia de Muertos uh, event that was done in partnership with the Mexican consulate in Atlanta. Uh, the uh, ability to, you know, look at these cultural connections and, and find conjoining links, things that are similar, uh, ways that we approach things, uh, even the way that we approach things differently uh, is really, really meaningful way of bringing your site to life. Um, you know, I'd also note that, you know, art installations can be really uh, impactful on your site as well. Uh, one thing that comes to mind, we did a, a installation with a Chinese American artist who looked at Victorian mausolea uh, and connected these burial practices uh, within the Western world to the Chinese tomb sweeping holiday uh, and the act of coming back to your family's burial ground and cleaning and uh, paying homage, homage to your ancestors. And, and so these artistic installations do the same thing. And not only is it, you know, different individuals being able to use their, the site in culturally relevant ways, it's also ways to invite other people into the site to learn about these different cultural practices. Next slide, please. So passive engagement and familiarity building. Uh, you know, the, so the photos that I shared in this are from around the turn of the century. Um, one is a young woman in New York reading a book and eating an apple. I don't recommend doing that while leaning against a headstone. 
Uh, but I wasn't around to tell her not to. <laughs> Uh, and the bottom, we have a photo from Dayton, Ohio, at Woodland Cemetery, where you have a picnicking day. Um, I've also included this quote from Emily Dickinson when she visited Mount Auburn Cemetery in Boston in 1846. There is a rich tradition of using cemeteries for recreation. Uh, before there were city parks, there were cemeteries, and the Victorians really designed uh, their cemeteries, Victorian garden cemeteries, for the living. They were designed for recreation, for strolling, for picnicking, for music, for, for people to exist within that space on a day-to-day -day basis. Uh, you know, this is something that, you know, the idea that you have to have a very somber and, um, and, and subdued kind of conduct in a cemetery is, is a very recent attitude. Uh, it's a very Western attitude as well. Uh, you know, there is a very long tradition of celebrations and recreation taking in place in cemeteries uh, in Latin America and in Africa and Asia. Uh, and, you know, the daily use of the cemetery is one of the most critical ways that they can remain relevant today. Uh, passive engagement, you know, doesn't necessarily require an intermediary for experiencing the cemetery. It's just how people use the site. Uh, and, you know, encouraging the be to grow comfortable with being there, with being within the cemetery setting and with normalizing the experience of being in a cemetery. Next slide, please. So what does passive engagement and familiarity build, uh, building look like? Uh, so it can take a lot of different forms. Uh, on the left, we have the Run Like Hell 5K in Oakland Cemetery. Cemetery people, we love a, a good pun. Uh, and this was one activity that you know didn't necessarily at all relate to the history of the site, but encouraged people to enjoy it, to be on site, and to you know grow to love and care for the site as stakeholders, as members of the public. But you know, passive engagement can also look like site signage. On the right, we have in Cortland Rural Cemetery in Cortland, New York. Uh, some self-guided tour signage that was put up. And, you know, tour signage is a great way, you know, historical signs in general are a great way to, um, you know, be able to connect that passive use of to, usage to the history of the site itself and gives people a little bit of context. I don't know how many of y'all have been to a cemetery when you go and you are fascinated by the beautiful monuments, but you don't necessarily know the stories behind. And that's one way to reach these folks without always necessarily having to have a docent on site, an intermediary. Uh, next slide. It can also look like picnicking. I noticed in the chat, we there's a very long tradition of picnicking within cemeteries, uh, as did Emily Dickinson when she mentioned all of these different sites that she went to in Boston. Of course, she included Mount Auburn on that list. Uh, it can also look like weddings, uh, which may be surprising for many people, but you know you have these beautiful mausolea that look like chapels, uh, different monuments uh, that you know hold a lot of meaning to people, uh, and these can be beautiful locations that bring people on site that wouldn't necessarily have gone to the cemetery on their own. But once they're there, they see the value and they see how special these places are and what meaning they hold. Next slide. I had to include, I myself got married within a cemetery uh, during COVID. My husband and I, before we were able to hold our big family wedding, we eloped. Uh, that is Director of Preservation at Oakland Cemetery, Ashley, uh, Ashley Shares, that is the officiant. Uh, and, you know, this was really special. This was, you know, something that, you know, although I wasn't able to celebrate you know, with my family at the time during COVID, I was still able to have something that was meaningful to me in a place that I loved uh, at, you know, when we could. Uh, next slide, please. Now, social media. Everyone can create a social media account. So I absolutely recommend if you don't currently have a social media presence for your cemetery, Absolutely, that is step one. Before you even hold the cemetery tours, this is how you get the word out about them. Uh, and I really recommend in particular the really visual social medias. So Facebook is great for, you know, content and information and, and you know, posting links to blog posts on the history of the site. 
Uh, but what really often draws people in are the visuals of a cemetery. Uh, Laurel Hill Cemetery in Philadelphia has an incredible TikTok. I definitely recommend it. Um, but, you know, really all of these major cemeteries that have jumped, you know, fully into programming within the U.S., uh, Instagram is a great way to showcase the, you know, beauty that can be found within cemetery sites. Uh, on the right, you have Greenwood, Greenwood Cemetery's Instagram account. Um, and this is also a way that you can, you know, share a snippet of history, share that little spark that hopefully turns into a flame uh, for their passion for the site, for their desire to be there, to invest in it. Next slide, please. So volunteer recruitment. Uh, you know, I would say, first and foremost, it's really critical to identify stakeholders. Now, descendants are your number one stakeholder. Uh, you know, I really, you know, when you go into interpretation, when you go into um, you know, hardscape and landscape restoration or, or work, you know, descendants always need to be contacted first. Uh, this is something that um, panelist Everett Fly really talked about well in, in our first seminar in particular, is just that critical role that descendants have to play. And, and you can continue to, you know, cultivate that relationship and learn the stories that you then want to share with the public. But this is also a great group of people when you're first looking to, you know, identify potential volunteers. They have skin in the game, as it were. Um, you know, university students and classes uh, are usually great places to look, especially for individuals that are learning to gain, you know, specialized training, um, you know, going to surrounding neighborhoods. Oftentimes, there's kind of a, uh, a unofficial uh, relationship that neighborhoods have with the cemeteries uh, that are near them. You know, people are already spending time, although it's not in a really formal way. So take the opportunity to formalize that relationship. Uh, build a sense of ownership between, you know, neighborhood residents uh, and cemetery residents. <laughs> Uh, also, I recommend looking at companies and organizations that might have historic ties to the cemetery. So if the founder of a company is buried in that historic site, you know, go to them and ask them if they want to do a work day. You know, looking at, um, you know, hardscape uh, cleaning with with landscape work, you know, always with with prioritizing, you know, kind of cultural landscapes and, and what needs to, what should or should not be done on your site. Uh, but you can work with folks uh, to, you know, get this work done faster with more hands um, on deck. Uh, now for maintaining engagement, oh. <laughs> maintaining engagement, you know, once you have put all of this work into training a volunteer, showing them the proper ways to clean a headstone, um, you know, looking at, the history and training them on tours and 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 working events or, or programming at your site, um, you know, there's really critical to keep up with them. You know, you get people onto the site once, and there's a real desire to continue to engage. Um, and so, staying on top of that and making uh, a concerted effort towards focusing on you know longevity and the sustainability of your volunteer program is really critical. Next slide. Uh, so. Thank you so much. Uh, we're going to be moving on to the Q&A section of our webinar. Uh, you can ask your questions by plugging them into the uh, Q&A function at the bottom of your screen. I know Priya will probably enter in directions for that as well, uh, but I encourage all of our panelists to come back on camera and we'll ask a few questions. All right. Uh, so first up, um, let's see, uh, Molly shared a lot of great technological approaches, including GPR and photogrammetry. Can you say more about the accessibility, practicality, and affordability of these tools for amateurs looking to care for cemeteries that are not cared for by a city? Yeah, I'm happy to address that question. Um, with photogrammetry in particular, there are apps out there that are free and software that augments the data, the, the photos that you pull from the app and turns that into a 3D model. 
And with those tools, you can play around with textures that kind of bring out some of those, um, those hidden inscriptions that are, are illegible at this time by using those, they're called textured meshes. You can um, be able to, to bring those to light and, and see the, the missing inscriptions. Um, those, those are both accessible and free. Um, they're not, um, the app is super easy to use. Playing around with the 3D modeling is a little more complicated, but there are programs that you can play around with and figure that out. So I encourage you to explore that. And I listed some of those programs in the chat. Um, for some of the other methods that we were talking about, in particular, GPR, GIS mapping, things like that are pricey. They do come um, with a price tag. Uh, we have found a great method for addressing that is grants fundraising, and I'll, I'll be happy to plug in some um, grants that would fit this. But additionally, going to schools that are trying to teach their students these techniques and making your cemetery available as a training ground. Um, so that's what we did with the um, the ground printing trading radar. We worked with um, a trades expert that was willing to teach college students how to engage with this technology. Um, so that might be a method to cut down on the cost and also train a new generation on how to use these tools. Thanks, Molly. Um, we have a question about, you know, whether or not cleaning headstones and establishing the thinking that headstones should all be bright white can cause kind of long-term damage to cemeteries in the future. So, you know, if people expect them to be bright white, uh, you know, will this encourage them to later start cleaning on their own and use the incorrect material? And this is an open question. I'll take that one. Yeah, and that's what I was saying when I talked about your site needs to decide what's sustainable for it. And as I mentioned before, I don't think running out and cleaning every headstone is the right answer. Um, it really depends on the look you're going for. Um, I think cemeteries can absolutely be overcleaned. We don't recommend the use of any bleaches or any inappropriate cleaners. And I think most people who, at least that I found, and like I said, I've worked with thousands of people uh, doing cleaning. I think most people when they clean with something like D2, when they're first done, it's kind of, you know, it's lighter. It's not exactly white by any means, but it's cleaner. I think most people are pretty happy with that look. Um, I've never had anyone sit back and say, you know, not, not clean enough for me. I, I want to, I want to, you know, do it over. And one of the things is just education. Um, I definitely don't think, you know, a, a 15 minute talk on this is enough to get someone out there to start doing it. It was really more about not doing certain things. And, but I think anyone who's interested in this should take a class, should go out and clean, um, it's not terribly difficult to learn how to do it the right way. It's, it's actually very, very simple. And then, you know, that responsibility of going on to teach other people the right way to do it. And, you know, how clean is that stone ever going to get? You know, historic marble who's been sitting out for 200 years is never going to look gleamingly white. Um, you know, and, and in the past, something like Arlington that were so gleamingly white, the reality is those those stones were replaced on a regular basis because they were used uh, in the past. They used daybreak, uh, which is 72 percent sodium hypochloride, so a super concentrated bleach and pressure wash, and then they just replaced on a regular basis. And the Army and the VA has stopped doing that. I will also say that although we can hope that if the experts put out the word don't 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 overclean, that that's going to stop people from cleaning. People are going to do it on their own. Uh, so I think it's really critical that you know we spread the word as much as possible as to how to do it correctly. It's kind of a human instinct, I think, to want to clean headstones, um, regardless of what we hope to encourage people. You're absolutely right, Mary. People are going to clean no matter what. So the best thing is trying to get good words out. Because I still talk to people almost every day who are bleaching and grinding and things like that. So really just trying to get, um, you know, the word out, the right things to do. Jason, on that note, logic cleaner, is that okay to use? Oh. I'm actually Googling that as we speak because I've never heard of that cleaner. All right, plug it into the chat when you're done. <laughs> okay. <laughs> All right. Uh, 
We have a question regarding interpretation. Is there a concern that bringing attention to a cemetery could put it in danger by putting it, quote, on the radar of vandals, especially with rural cemeteries where there may not be neighbors close by to keep an eye on it? I really would say um, that interpretation, if anything, does more to discourage vandalism uh, because it brings more people aware to the fact that the cemetery is there and exists, more people keeping an eye out, um, and they can identify vandalism really quickly if it happens. Uh, the vandals already know that the cemeteries are there. We may think that, you know, we are the only people who know about the small rural cemetery, but I guarantee uh, that there are, you know, chat boards online where people are like, hey, found this great rural cemetery, let's check it out. Uh, I know at Oakland, which is not a perpetual care cemetery, um, you know, prior to 1976, when the foundation was founded, the cemetery, despite not having any programming, no tours, you know, very hands-off relationship between the city and the cemetery, the city owning the cemetery, um, and the vandalism still happened. Vandalism happens. It's it's something that people do, but the more people that you can kind of bring into the site, uh, it's often that it appears that, you know, people see the vandalism more, but that's actually because you have more eyes on it and you can see it when it happens and you can address it when it happens. Um, you know, vandalism at a site where people don't visit very often, often goes kind of under the radar for longer and people don't realize it's happened. Um, I also think, especially in October, um, it can be really great to hold programming in your cemetery because it discourages the kind of opportunistic people who want to be in the cemetery and are up to no good. Uh, if on Halloween night you are lighting up the cemetery brightly, you have tour guides, uh, you have you know, visitors that are interested in learning about the history, people aren't going to have as much of an instinct to sneak on site and do damage because there's people there that are gonna see them. Um, so I, I would say, although I completely understand the concern, it kind of is the opposite effect that programming tends to lower the rates of vandalism and, and raises the ability to address vandalism in the immediate. Um, no, I wanna add to something really quick to that, Mary. I totally agree with you. And I think working with youth groups really help helps to decrease vandalism because a lot of times I worked with a lot of youth groups and the first thing I asked was how many have ever been to the cemetery and almost never and people don't even bring their children to 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 funerals any longer and so almost none of them so it became comes this place of fear we see it in horror movies and it's this scary place to come and they get older and they drink beer they knock things over and that but Reaching them at a young age and showing them the beauty in the cemetery, I have found has really decreased vandalism. Because if only one kid in that group maybe came to a program and fell in love with a monument and the beauty of the carving, they're more likely to stop the other ones going, whoa, this isn't a scary place. This is a really cool place. Let me bring my family back out, my friends back out. Um, so definitely bringing people out, I think, really does help. Absolutely. Um... Uh, let's see. Um, now, please refresh us for how is a cemetery site defined as historic? Thank you. Um, I mean, there really isn't one way to define the cemetery as historic. Uh, Jason, you want to hop in on that? Um, in, I mean, technically, if it's over 50, you know, 100 years old, it's historic. If it has people of note, it's historic. If it has, um, you know, architecture that makes it significant, it's historic. But it, to me, everyone who's buried there is important. Um, everyone has a, a family member or someone they love or, you know, some somebody that's important to them or important to history in some way. So to me, all cemeteries are historic and should be valued as such. Um, whether it's eligibly listed on the National Register or something like that, um, you know, make that's a different idea. But I think, I think all cemeteries are historic by nature just because of the value of um, the monuments of the people that are in them. Absolutely. 
Molly, I think a lot of the work that y'all do with uh, the Hope Crew kind of brings that home too as well, um, the meaning that it holds for communities. Yeah, absolutely. By making those spaces available to a younger audience, that's one way, just as Jason touched on, but also engaging the community. A lot of times they don't know the stories that lie right there in their neighborhood in these cemeteries, important people that were buried there, people that helped not only form their communities, but also their state, their countries, and creating a connection to the spaces with the community is a really great way to also protect the site because once somebody knows, they're more apt to return and assist in making sure that site is staying uh, clean, staying accessible and um, open to the public. Uh, and it also can be a safety concern, you know, if, if you know, you want to bring people on site, but there's toppled over headstones or kind of busted up pathways. Um, is there anything, this is open question, tips of the trade, is there anything you can use to help read a stone that is otherwise unreadable, even after cleaning, something that would highlight the lettering that is still there? For me, the, one of the things that I, I do commonly, and, and it really works, a couple things. One, there's all kinds of filters on your cell phone now um, that work really well. You can go in the filter settings and turn it to negative and highlight. So our phones are an amazing resource that help a lot. Another thing is bringing light out to the cemetery. Um, so one thing is a photo reflector. We talked a little bit about this in our last webinar. So if you wanna um, go back and watch that one, there's a few tips for photography, but bringing a mirror or a reflector out, getting at about a raking light across the lettering really helps. Another is to go out, you know, a real overcast day, or if you have permission to go out at night, uh, using a flashlight, not your cell phone, but a real flashlight that has, um, you know, a directional beam, um, and actually shining that directly across the headstone will sh leave shadow lines and all the lettering. And that's a great way to be able to read um, I, you can read headstones that you didn't think ever had anything on them. Um, I picked that up from archaeologists. That's how they uh, photograph and draw the hieroglyphs uh, and carvings, uh, like in South America, things like that, is by putting these, these large work lights across. Uh, so that really does help. And don't do rubbings. Don't do rubbings or someone in the chat says, you know, flour and shaving cream, all of that can cause damage. All that's bad. Yeah, yeah. A lot of well-intentioned people do 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 rubbing. And it's very bad. Um, <laughs> uh, okay, so we have a question. Um, can you recommend a good source pertaining to stewardship and preservation of cemeteries in archaeological context? My colleagues and I work with management of isolated burials and grave sites associated with National Historic Trails in remote localities. If geophysical investigations reveal anomalies that are likely to be unmarked graves, would it be a preferred approach to leave these unmarked so as to protect them from unauthorized excavation? Um, what period gravestones that what period gravestones that do remain are derived from small sandstone slabs, which are uh, friable, and we don't clean them, but they were vandalized with paint. So, what cleaning approach would you recommend? That's a lot. Um, <laughs> um, okay, so starting with the first question, can you recommend good source pertaining to stewardship and preservation of cemeteries in archaeological context? I would contact your local state historic preservation office and find out uh, who, so someone in your state should be assigned that that is their job. So usually historic cemeteries falls under archaeology. I would talk to them. I would start there, talking to your local state SHPO officer about the archaeological context of those cemeteries. Um, the other is I probably would leave those graves unmarked, um, map them well, mark them in GPS, you know, come up with a system that you know where they are, share this with someone like your SHPO. Um, but I, pro I wouldn't put any kind of physical marker there. I would leave it as they are. 
Um, and then, you know, my lab made natural. Uh, they probably don't have much engraving left on them. Um, so then what I would recommend, if they are vandalized with paint, what cleaning approach would you recommend? So removing paint is a very difficult question because it totally depends on the type of the paint, uh, how long it's been on there, is um, was the stone wet when it was when it was painted? Lots of different things. Uh, feel free to contact me or a professional conservator um, if it does actually happen. So there's lots of different ways, but it really there's a lot of factors that help us decide what uh, what resources to use to remove paint. So that's one I'm always sort of scared to give a generic answer. Use this. Because uh, one time it might work great, and the next time it doesn't do anything. Um, so if that does happen, send a picture, drop an email. Uh, I'll ask you some questions, and then we'll go from there. I would also say that there is kind of a instinct also, um, you know, if people find a old cemetery and there's small headstones or there's no headstones, um, there's such an instinct to go in and and add headstones to to change it to improve it, uh, but oftentimes you really lose a lot of the cultural um, you know cultural significance of the site when you go in and try to make drastic changes as well. Um, so uh, why do you, uh, why does is headstone cleaning recommended to start from the bottom up? Why do they recommend to start from the bottom? So if you have a small marker, it does not matter. If you get a larger marker, um, it's going to sound counterintuitive, but I promise it works. Um, if you clean from the top and work down, all the dirty water runs down and gets more absorbed into the dirty stone. So you're actually going to do a lot more work once you get lower onto the stone. If you have cleaned from the bottom and work up, you have a clean surface, you have your you know, your biological mass has gone, things like that. And the, the water as you rinse will run off much quicker and it will not absorb into it. Um, so small markers, anything below about two or three feet, uh, I'd say three feet, doesn't matter. You can clean them top, bottom, bottom top, doesn't matter. As you get to taller ones, it really does uh, work better to clean from the bottom and work your way up. Um, can, Bali and Jason, uh, can y'all explain further how rubbings are bad for markers? I'll let Jason as a conservator talk on that one. Um, so they're not always bad, um, but generally speaking, we try to avoid them. Um, I, last night I went to a talk here at AGS that showed these horrible blackened marbles uh, where someone didn't know what they're doing and coated it completely in carbon soot. Um, so the reality is done well, it's pro you know, done well by a professional who knows what they're doing and has really checked out the stone, you're probably going to be okay. The reality is most people see it, they want to do it. And I've worked behind so many people to remove crayons from grave markers. Um, I have seen grave markers markers toppled over by someone pressing too hard to try to do a rubbing. Uh, I've seen people put metal clips on them and scratch them, trying to put their paper on them. So I think the reality is it's the classic case. If you really know what you're doing, you're probably going to be okay. Most people don't. So the, the chance of the damage is, is fairly large. Um, it's definitely not something I would recommend for school groups. Uh, I see that a lot. Like I said, I've, I've had to remove a lot of crayon over the years uh, from that exact thing. This is a great Veterans Day project um, kind of thing. So as a general rule, we say, you know, no rubbings. A lot of cemeteries, another thing people don't think about, you actually need permission to do rubbing there unless it's your own family. And most cemeteries will not give you permission because of the potential for damage. Mm -hmm. Also, if a marble headstone is showing a lot of sugaring, then that physical wear can be really damaging as well. Anything that, you know, kind of rubs against the, the marker as well. Yeah, and a lot of um, slates and brownstones actually uh, 
delaminate. So they have a, uh, you can, we, we sort of sound them before we work on them to listen for delamination. But a lot of times that rubbing will actually pop that delamination off by pushing on it. Uh, so that's another thing. That's why a lot of places in New England outlawed rubbing years ago because of people pushing on them and popping uh, that thin layer between and getting some de delamination because of that. Right. Um, Jason, there is a question directly for you about what white, what large white spots can indicate on um, on stone. I saw that one. That's hard to answer without a photograph. Feel free to show me a send me a photograph. Um, it's probably a lichen. Um, I that's what jumps in my mind instantly. I see a lot of that sort of these lichens of uh, really thin very white or very really light green um, that start and they grow in sort of these large, um, you know, cir circular areas. Um, so it's probably a lichen. And if so, if it's granite, it's really not going to do any harm to it. Uh, if you want to remove it, something, uh, just water and a, a brush would take them off. Uh, D2 would definitely take it off. Um, but yeah, feel free to send a photograph, but I suspect it's probably a lichen. Um, Molly, what are some uh, photogrammetry apps that you recommend and what's their ease of use and functionality? Sure, I um, plugged in some of the links in the chat. That's more for the software. Um, but if you go to your app store and, and look in the photogrammetry um, apps, look for free, you'll find one. One we've used is called um, Mesh Room. It looks like Mushroom, but it's an E instead, Mesh Room. And it works well with the software that um, can augment the data to create those 3D models. Um, but Google it, you'll, you'll find a lot of great free resources. Um, but the software is the thing that is more important because you can even use your personal photos to, to plug into certain spots um, if you've taken them in the accurate positioning and plug those into those software. It is easier when you have the app that's kind of directing you how to, to take the photos. Um, but it's the software that usually is the most expensive. So check out some of those software uh, recommendations that we plugged into the chat. Absolutely. Um, there is a question about uh, methods for locating graves where the headstones have been moved. Um, that's one where we have had great success with the ground penetrating radar. And there are several methods of, of um, acquiring that data and using um, different uh, filters um, to, to figure out where those burial plots are. Um, so that would be one method. Again, it's not an inexpensive method, um, but maybe working with a school that's an archaeology school that's teaching that technique might be a way um, to offset some of that cost. Mm -hmm. um, and do you all have any good resources for ledger cleaning and repair? Um, if it depends on what you're cleaning off, but if it's general biological, then it's there's no difference in cleaning that. Um, repair again, ledgers can be made of a variety of different ways. Maybe they're on the ground, maybe they're on a box vault, maybe they're a tabletop. Um, so feel free to send a picture, and I can give better recommendations that way. Um, yeah, it, it would have to see a picture before I could answer that. Absolutely. Um, I just wanted to jump in really quickly and go back a step and um, highlight a project in which um, they used cadaver dogs to find a, a missing grave. Um, that, they knew that the burial plot was somewhere in the vicinity, headstones were missing, and it was an inexpensive way to know that there were people buried there and then go back later when they have the funds raised to do the ground penetrating radar to locate the actual graves themselves. But it helped them zero in on the area that they knew was there but didn't know exactly where. Yeah, absolutely. I've seen that done before. It's really cool. Uh, all right. Uh, so I did notice that we had in the chat a few questions about uh, access to sites and ownership. I really encourage y'all to check out our first uh, webinar in the series, which is can be found on the preservation uh, web forum. Um, and uh, if you'll pull up the PowerPoint again for me, please. Um, next slide. 
if you all have any additional questions, you know, please feel free to reach out. Uh, plop the emails into the chat. Uh, certainly willing to continue this conversation and and you know provide what assistance we can to the cemetery community. Um, our upcoming webinars include the June 29th State Historic Tax Credit uh, webinar, which uh, highlights opportunities for affordable housing and sustainability. We also have a forum member-only series, which is everything you wanted to know about saving places but were afraid to ask, with experts from the National Trust, uh, which is coming up in July and August. Next slide, please. Uh, Again, uh, as Jason mentioned, um, we have our Documenting Historic Gravesites Conference, uh, Documenting Historic Gravesites Workshop at the Password Conference, which is being held this year uh, in DC, uh, November 8th through 10th, uh, as well. And then we have our workshop, which will be November 10th, with a work day on November 11th. Uh, now, the registration information has been plugged into the chat. Oh, real quick, I think Jason did want to answer one more question before we hopped off today. Jason, please feel free to hop back on. Sure, I got a minute to read some of them. Uh, I'll, I'll answer this one question. Uh, Linda Ellis uh, asked a question regarding using D2. So it seems like a lot of people are trying are using Orvis soap to clean a headstone and then uh, treating it with D2 as a biocide. And the question is, is this really necessary? The answer is it actually, you negate the, the use of D2. So Orvis, uh, for those who don't know, Orvis is an ionic detergent. It's made for cleaning horses, perfectly safe for headstones, no problem, uh, but it doesn't contain a biocide. So all you're gonna do is remove the soiling and the, the dirt, and it's not gonna do anything to stop biological growth from coming back, but completely safe. No worries. Um, D2 has a detergent, so it has a surfactant. It'll do the exact same thing Orvis did, plus add a biocide. Now, the reason people want to clean with Orvis first is it's super inexpensive. D2 is, is definitely more costly. So the idea is to scrub with Orvis and then treat it with D2. The reality is that doesn't work because you, for one, we don't like mixing chemicals. Uh, we don't want to try to, you know, mix two chemicals together uh, or even that close to each other. But cleaning with Orvis first, um, you've now left an ionic film, basically, an anionic film, rather, on the headstone. The D2 isn't going to work at all. Um, it's going to have very minimal effect. It's not really going to get in there and do its thing. So you've really kind of wasted the D2 on it. Um, so I don't recommend it. If you're just going to clean with Orvis, just clean with Orvis. Just know the biological growth is going to come back. If not, if you're worried about it, you should just clean with D2 and be done with it. Uh, mixing the two. A, another thing is I don't like cleaning these stones more than we have to. So some people are scrubbing them twice. That's also not a good thing for the stone. Um, so I would either stick with just Orvis and know the biological growth is coming back or just use D2 and and but not mix the two. You're, you're, you're canceling each other out. And you can learn more about that on our November 11th workshop day uh, on cleaning uh, in DC. Uh, you can get all the FaceTime you want with Jason Church uh, and, and access his knowledge, which is immense. Uh, next slide, please. Thank you so very much for everyone who joined us today. Thank you to our panelists. This was great to hear from y'all. Um, we have uh, some links up on the slides. You can visit our website, look for webinar upcoming webinars, as well as the webinar archives, including the um, recordings for our first two sessions of this webinar series. And if you have any questions, please feel free to reach out to forum online at savingplaces.org. But hope you all have a great rest of your day. Thank you for joining us and uh, have a great rest of your day. <laughs>